Hey, so this is Allison. I am here with my co-host Brett, and you are listening to Red Menace Podcast, where today we are going to be going over yet another work of Marxist theory. We're part of our sort of uh, return to Marx's works after going through Lenin, Stalin, Mao, and some other later developments in order to try to really see what it is that they're drawing on. So today we're going to be looking at Marx's economic and philosophic manuscripts of 1844, which you may find are very interesting texts that we're doing our best to pull things out of, but that's what we're going to be looking at today. Uh, if you like what we're doing here, please go ahead and consider supporting us. You can find us on patriot.com slash the red menace, where we offer bonus episodes. We're doing, for example, a live Q&A this month where we'll be getting on a live chat and talking with our patrons and answering questions back and forth. It's been a lot of fun when we've done it in the past, and I'm very excited for it into the future. So if that interests you, check us out on Patreon. Additionally, if you want to follow what's going on at the podcast, you can find us on Twitter at red underscore menace underscore pod, where we post uh, sort of regular updates about things and you can keep track of episodes as they're coming out and new ideas that we're developing as we go. So like I said, today will be the economic and philosophical manuscripts. Uh, A tiny little bit of context, these manuscripts mostly are a set of notes that Marx has about political economy. They are very dense and very complicated and do not necessarily make a total coherent argument. So we're going to do our best to draw out what we see as some of the main lessons from them, but you might find that it misses or skips over certain sections of them. That's just because of the nature of these documents. We hope that you'll go read those sections, you'll figure out exactly what it is that Marx is trying to say in them, but we're trying to keep things focused because obviously we don't want this to be like a three hour long podcast. Yeah, and one thing I'd add really quick is just a little interesting historical note, which is that these again were sort of notes in the spring and summer of 1844 that Marx took, and it was really uh, discovered later after the Bolshevik Revolution (laughs) by Soviet archivists who found these old textbooks and published them into this thing. So it is sort of disjointed and what you would expect from somebody basically taking notes, not having fully formulated it into a complete argument, but just the historical note that uh, it was really rediscovered after the Bolshevik Revolution. And it's worth saying that if the Bolshevik Revolution never happened, maybe we wouldn't have these manuscripts. And that's kind of interesting (laughs) to think about. Yeah, it would certainly seem like it. Okay, so I will start off section one. And I sort of had to pick and choose what to focus on in this entire section because there are so many notes, so much information, so many things that Marx touches on. And, you know, a lot of things that he developed other places later on in his life that I sort of had to whittle it down to what I really wanted to focus on. And so what I'm going to focus on here is a sort of summary of his views of like rents and landlords, because I think it's particularly interesting and particularly relevant. And then I'm really going to focus mostly on the development of of the concept of alienation, what Marx in this uh, in this text calls estranged labor. And we'll get into all of that, but some things I am going to leave aside so I can focus on the main thing. So keep that in mind. I'm not covering every single thing that you know he puts out there. Partly because a lot of these, as we've noted, are from earlier um, documents, are sort of put together notes, things that he didn't really fully elaborate on and, and turn into a sort of systematic understanding until later. And so it would sort of be hard to, to suss all of that out. I do want to say that a lot of what he's doing in this text is basically putting up huge quotes from people like Adam Smith and David Ricardo, huge sort of liberal political economists of the time. And he's showing where they're right, points that they make that actually go against the conclusions of capitalism more broadly. Um, He's showing where they're wrong and why they're wrong. He's showing how many of their arguments go on later to undermine themselves. So especially in this like first part, uh, you really see these like almost like page or two pages of things that other economists, bourgeois economists have written. And then Marx maybe just making a note or having some reply or, you know, doing a pithy little devastation of that argument, etc. So it makes this sort of particularly difficult to deal with. But um, so I'll pass over when he's talking about wage labor. I'll pass over his notes on profit and capital and I'll move right to rent and specifically the relationship that landlords have. And Marx starts off this um, segment by saying The rights of the landlords have their origins in robbery. And that really sets the table for this entire discussion. Marx goes on to talk about a lot of things. He talks about how rent includes not only the land, but also the resources around it, right? Landlords charge more for rent if they own property that happens to be close to other things, which they don't own, but which being close to increases the value of. 
Rent is not proportionate to what the landlord has done to improve the land, but rather what the tenant can afford to give. Ergo, Mark says, it's always some sort of a monopoly. And we can understand this very well, right? If you're charging rent in San Francisco as opposed to Omaha, Nebraska, you can charge a lot more because the all the property around, you know, that place in San Francisco is worth a lot more. There's a lot more, you know, things that people are attracted to, like the climates, like the beaches, uh, like the community, Silicon Valley, etc. And so all those things, although the landlord has nothing to do with any of it, goes to increase the rent which the landlord gets. So by doing very little, the landlord gets a lot more than he puts in. Marx goes on to talk about how money makes money. Landlords can buy land and then they rent it at whatever price they want, even well after the price of initial investment is paid off. So I could use an example from my own life. My mom and stepdad have lived and rented in the same house since I was a child. Um, By all measures, they've paid off that entire house, right? Um, in the overall amount of money they put into it in rent. But because it's rent, um, they have to continue paying it to stay in there. So, you know, you're talking $1,100 every single month, even though they've basically paid off the house and in any just society they would own the house. But the landlord is continuing to profit off of them. And that's just one example from my own life that highlights this overall point that Marx is making. Economy turns the fertility of the land into an attribute of the landlord. The rent of land is established as the result of a struggle between tenant and landlord. Landlords exercise monopoly over the tenants. The demand for their commodity, the dwelling and the land it's on, can go on expanding indefinitely even though the supply stays the same. The landlord exploits everything from which society benefits, as I was just saying. Rents increase with population. Rents increase with the construction of nearby railways, roads, businesses, etc., the overall development of society. These increases in rent do not increase the labor needed to collect it, and the landlord profits more and more without adding anything of value himself, and improvements in the productive powers of labor in the whole society decrease the price of the cost of living while raising the cost of rent. The landlord therefore benefits doubly in that the landlord earns more from rent while paying less for goods overall, even though he has not contributed at all to that increase in productivity. So Marx says, quote, It is absurd to conclude, as Smith does, that since landlords exploit every benefit that comes to society, the interest of the landlord is identical with society. This is not true for a bunch of reasons. One, Marx says landlords are interested in the growth of population, production, and society's needs. In short, the increase of wealth benefits the landlord, but as we've already seen previously, the increase in wealth is identical with an increase of overall poverty and wage slavery. Two, Political economists admit that landlords' interests are in opposition to the tenants, you know, in this case, tenant farmers, which make up a significant portion of society. So if the landlord's interests were identical with that of society, you'd have to explain away this inherent opposition between landlords and those who rent from them. Three, as the landlord can demand more rent from the tenant farmer, the less wages the farmer pays out. And as the farmer drives down wages, the more rent the landlord demands. It follows that the landlord's interests are just as hostile to the farmer's workers as is the capitalist to their own workers. It forces down wages in the same way. Four, since the reduction in the price of manufactured products raises the rent of land, the landlord has a direct interest in, quote, all the misery associated with industrial production broadly, which is against many people's interests, as we know. And five, the interest of one landlord is not even identical to the interest of other landlords on account of competition between them. So here Marx has taken an argument put up by Adam Smith that the landlord's interests are on the whole in alignment with the interests of the broader society and systematically dismantled that one by one. In general, the relationship between small and large landowners is like that of small and large capitalists. But in addition to all of that, special circumstances will lead inevitably to the accumulation of large landed property and to the absorption of smaller property by it. The small landed proprietor working on his own account stands in relation to the big landowner in the same exact way that an artisan possessing his own tools does to the factory owner. Eventually, due to competition, a large part of landed property will fall into the hands of big capitalists as they buy out the land themselves so as to reduce the role of rent in their overhead costs. The final consequence of all of this is the abolition of the distinction between capitalist and landowner. So that there remain, Marx says, altogether, only two real classes of the population, the working class and the capitalist class. 
The stolen land of feudalism, what we know as primitive accumulation, is thus transformed into the stolen land of capitalism. But whereas the former was personified in the form of the Lord and thus had an individual relationship with the land and those who worked on it and thus a sort of human face and character, the latter, the more modern instantiation, is transformed into a mere commodity under capitalism, just like human beings are. The medieval proverb, there is no land without its Lord, is thus replaced, Marx tells us, by that other proverb, money knows no master. And in this transformation, the domination of men by dead matter is expressed completely. In the face of this reality, Marx urges us not to attempt some return to feudal ownership, but rather to push forward to the abolition of private property altogether, to reject the idea that the land itself belongs to anyone, and to assert its common ownership by those who bubble up out of it, who live on it, and who depend on it. Marx says, quote, Common ownership of the land reestablishes on a rational basis the intimate relationship between humanity and the earth, for the earth ceases to be an object of huckstering, and through free labor and free enjoyment become once more the true personal property of all humanity. End quote. Now let's move on to what this text is really known for, which is the articulation of Marx's theory of alienation. Let's get into it. So Marx opens this section showing how he, in the previous chapters, has proceeded entirely from the premises of the political economists of his time, like Adam Smith, David Ricardo, etc., and through their own premises and arguments, has shown, quote, that the worker sinks to the level of a commodity and becomes indeed the most wretched of commodities, that the wretchedness of the worker is in inverse proportion to the power and magnitude of his production, that the necessary result of competition is the accumulation of capital in a few hands, and thus the restoration of monopoly in a most terrible form, and that finally the distinction between capitalist and landlord, like that between the tiller of the soil and the factory worker, disappears, and that the whole of society must fall apart into the two classes, property owners and propertyless workers." End quote. He then goes on to make a profound claim that foreshadows so much of what is to come in the tradition of Marxism. He says, quote, Political economy proceeds from the fact of private property. It does not explain it to us. In other words, the work of people like Smith and Ricardo are products of capitalism, not explanations of how it actually operates or how it arises. In effect, like so much of the economics of our own time, it takes the dominant system as given and then works backwards to justify it. When you walk into an Econ 101 class today, you are walking into a class that presupposes the truth of capitalism, not a class that seeks to really understand it from an objective point of view, much less challenge it. As Marx says, political economy expresses in general abstract formulas the material process through which private property actually passes, and these formulas it then takes for laws. It does not comprehend these laws, i.e., it does not demonstrate how they arise from the very nature of private property. Political economy throws no light on the cause of the division between labor and capital and between capital and land. When, for example, it defines the relationship of wages to profit, it takes the interest of the capitalist to be the ultimate cause, i.e. it takes for granted what it is supposed to explain. End quote. Political economists do for capitalism what the theologian does when he explains the origin of evil in the world by recounting the story of the fall of man in the Garden of Eden. Namely, he assumes as a historical fact what is supposed to be explained. Arguing that evil came into the world by an historical act of evil explains nothing at all about the origins of evil. It merely pushes the question back into what Marx calls a gray, nebulous distance. Marx is determined, therefore, to proceed from actual economic facts. One fact, for instance, is that the worker becomes poor the more wealth he produces. In our own times, we could say something like, even though the productivity of the working class has risen dramatically over the last 40 years, real wages have stagnated. In effect, we are producing more than ever, but are poorer than we were before. Marx goes on, quote, Labor produces not only commodities, it produces itself and the worker as a commodity, and this at the same rate at which it produces commodities in general. This fact expresses merely that the object which labor produces, labor's product, confronts it as something alien, as a power independent of the producer. 
The product of labor is labor which has been embodied in an object, which has become material. It is the objectification of labor, end quote. Labor's ultimate realization, then, is its objectification into the form of a commodity which labor itself doesn't control. It is under these conditions that the products which labor creates appear as a loss of realization, something akin to the opposite of self-actualization. It may help to think about all of this through an example. So, let's say before the rise of capitalism, you were an artisan shoemaker in a village. From top to bottom, you created every aspect of the shoe, and the final product was the realization of your labor, a fully formed shoe that either yourself or someone else could use. Since you created that shoe, you controlled it. You decided who to give it to in exchange for how much. The full value of the shoe and the labor that went into it was returned to you. And you could then take that value and go buy something else that you needed like food, medicine, etc. Now imagine that same scenario under capitalism. Instead of making the full shoe, you are now on an assembly line where your job all day is to glue soles onto the bottom of countless shoes each day and then pass it on down the line to the next person who would skim the excess glue off and then pass it down to the next person who would put the shoe strings in it, etc., etc., etc. The final product is still a shoe, but it is not yours anymore. It is the owner of the shoe factory who sits up in his office and watches the assembly line from afar. It is the owner who then decides how much to sell the shoe for on the market. Once the shoe is sold, the owner of the factory pays you and the other workers a fraction of what he got in exchange for selling that shoe and pockets the rest as his own personal profit. Your skill set is no longer making shoes. It's simply applying glue to one piece of an endless line of shoes all day. In fact, you no longer know how to make an entire shoe, and you certainly don't have the capital to go off and start your own shoe business, even if you did, since the money you make from gluing soles onto shoes is just enough for dinner and rent. Tomorrow you'll have to come back so you can eat again. In that context, your labor is something very different than it was in the former context. And it is in this way that Marx says the worker becomes estranged or alienated from the product of their labor. The worker loses the object they helped create, and in the process has become a commodity themselves, just like the shoe, something to be bought and sold, totally subject to the market's demands. The more soles he glues onto the shoes, the fewer shoes he himself can own. Or put a different way, the more he recreates the conditions of his own exploitation, the more he falls under the domination of his real product, capital. Marx goes on to talk about workers' relationship to nature under these conditions. He argues that nothing can be created without nature, for it is the natural world that provides the raw material upon which labor is enacted, as well as the means for physical sustenance itself. Labor cannot live without objects on which to operate, and it also cannot live without the sustenance afforded to it by the natural world in the form of food and water. Under capitalism, the worker is given an object of labor in the form of receiving work from a capitalist, and then is given a means of sustenance in the form of a wage by that capitalist. In both cases, he is alienated from direct engagement with nature, cut off from his own life force. Only by selling his labor to a capitalist can he maintain himself as a physical being, and by maintaining himself as a physical being, he continues to exist as a worker. He is now alienated not only from the product of his labor, but also from nature itself. Moreover, by being reduced to a worker, alienated from what he creates and what created him, he becomes alienated from himself. But I am getting ahead of myself. Marx, to this point, has only shown methodically how the worker is alienated from the product of their labor. Now he aims to walk us through an explanation of how the worker becomes alienated from the activity of his work itself. Marx says, quote, Labor is external to the worker, i.e. it does not belong to his intrinsic nature, that in his work, therefore, he does not affirm himself, but denies himself, does not feel content, but unhappy, does not develop freely his physical and mental energies, but mortifies his body and ruins his mind. The worker, therefore, only feels himself outside his work, and in his work he feels outside himself. He feels at home when he is not working, and when he is working he does not feel at home. His labor is therefore not voluntary, but coerced. It is forced labor. It is therefore not the satisfaction of a need, it is merely the means to satisfy needs external to it. 
Its alien character emerges clearly in the fact that as soon as no physical or other compulsion exists, labor is shunned like the plague. End quote. This argument can be immediately recognized by any of us in the working class. We only feel at home when we are not at work, and when we are at work, we do not feel at home. Our labor is not voluntary, and if you doubt that fact, ask yourself this question. If you or any working person that you know hit the lottery tomorrow, what is the first thing that you or they would do? Quit your job. (laughs) It's such an obvious response, and we have all heard it a million times. The last thing any of us would do the day after hitting the lottery is clock into our shitty job. And that is what Marx means here when he says our labor is not voluntary, but coerced. It is forced labor. The moment the compulsion to earn a living is lifted, we do shun labor like the plague, do we not? And when we are at work, with no hope of winning the lottery, what are we often thinking about? When we will get off work. (laughs) On the shittiest days, as we are slogging through our miserable jobs, our couch at home appears in our mind as a paradise we wish we could escape back to. In the mornings, as we get up to the violent sounds of our alarm clocks, our beds become paradise lost, and we wish so deeply we could stay wrapped up in our blankets, forcing our bodies out of bed with resentment exploding in our bones. Now compare that to your alarm going off on the first day of a vacation. You welcome the sound and hop out of bed with excitement. It's not the bed itself that's the issue. It's the coercion or or non-coercion from which we are moved to climb out of it that matters. Marx is showing us how these feelings and thoughts we all have all the time are indicative of our own estrangement and alienation from our own lives and from the activity we are forced to engage in just to make ends meet. It's as true for us today as it was for workers 200 years ago. As a result of this, Marx says, the worker no longer feels himself to be freely active in any activity other than his animal functions, eating, drinking, having sex, etc. I, for one, have engaged in all of these activities on the clock, eating without clocking out, drinking alcohol on the clock to make the day less shitty, and even having sex on the clock a few times, which I have to say is quite the thrill and genuinely made me feel as if I was taking back some of the time stolen from me. To all of that, though, I would add taking a shit. For what is one of the most common ways we kill time at our soul-crushing jobs and show a tiny flicker of resistance to this whole damn system, if not by going into the bathroom and extending it as long as we can? I myself hold a personal record, which I'm very proud of, of once taking a two-hour shit on the clock, feeling like I was finally getting a leg up on the bastards and reveling in seeing how long I could milk the clock without getting caught. The perversity of this, Mark says, lies in the fact that we only feel human in our animal functions, and we feel like animals in our human functions. What is animal becomes human, and what is human becomes animal. How could any of us not find this state of affairs deeply alienating? After having laid out how workers are alienated from the product of their labor and the activity of their labor, Marx turns towards the sense of alienation which humans have towards themselves under capitalism. And to do this, Marx articulates his famous concept of species being. Admittedly, it is a fairly difficult concept to get a good grasp of, especially if you are only using this text to do it, but I will do my best to explain what he means here. Species being for Marx is our nature as homo sapiens, and it is what distinguishes us from other animals on earth. He explains that animals, although members of a species, don't experience their lives as such. They are not conscious of themselves as a member of a species, but exist only in the immediacy of their individual lives. A bear, for example, does not conceptualize itself as a member of the bear species because it doesn't have the capacity for conscious reflections that humans have. It merely experiences its own individual existence without any reference to bears outside itself, unless those bears are in its immediate awareness, be they at its cubs or a possible mate or a bear of the same sex invading its territory, etc., Human beings, on the other hand, have the capacity for abstract thought and self-consciousness, which allows us to understand ourselves as a part of humanity broadly. We do not see ourselves merely as individuals, but as members of our broader species, both historically and presently. In other words, we understand ourselves universally and can take our species and others as objects of conscious thought. The life activity of any animal, Marx goes on to talk about, is simply what that animal does how it acts on the external world in order to maintain its physical existence. The whole character of a species, Marx says, is contained in the character of its life activity. 
The animal is always just its life activity. It does not distinguish itself from it. It is its life activity. A bird is what a bird does. It flies, it makes nests, it catches worms, it feeds its chicks, etc. There is no separation between its life activity and itself. Human beings, on the other hand, make our life activity the object of our conscious thoughts. We can stand back from what we do and reflect on it. This ability to become conscious of our own life activity, to step back from it and ponder it in the abstract, is what makes us different from all other animals on earth. And it is this capacity that Marx says makes us into a species being. Because of this wonderful ability, we are not strictly determined in our behavior like animals are. We have some freedom. Animals produce things like beaver dams and ant colonies and bird's nests, but they produce them only in pursuit of the immediate needs of themselves and their offspring. Humans, Marx says, produce universally. We produce even when we are free from immediate physical need. We make art, we engage in science, we come up with philosophy, we organize into political movements, we build cities and airplanes, we rocket ourselves to the moon and back, etc. It is this productive activity upon the objective world through which we prove ourselves to be a species being. This free and productive activity is our life activity. We duplicate ourselves in our consciousness and also actively out in reality, and we see ourselves in a world that we have created. But where does alienation come in here? Well, Marx makes it very clear. When we are torn away from the things we create, when we are alienated from the products of our productive activity, we are separated from our own nature as freely and spontaneously creative creatures. Marx says it changes for us the life of the species into a means of individual life and turns individual life into the purpose of our species. In other words, it flips the whole situation on its head. Instead of consciously and freely creating our world together as an end in and of itself, our life activity becomes degraded to a mere means to our individual existence, to a mere means by which we get a wage. Spontaneous and free activity, which constitutes our very nature as human beings, is replaced with monotonous, repetitive, and unfree activity in pursuit of a wage which we then turn into food, clothes, and shelter. In other words, we become alienated from our own nature. We become strangers to ourselves. Marx says, quote, A estranged labor turns man's species being into a being alien to him, into a means of his individual existence. It estranges from man his own body, as well as external nature and his spiritual or human aspect. End quote. Okay, let's take a step back and reflect on the argument about alienation thus far. At this point, Marx has started from the brute economic fact that we as workers are alienated from the products that we create, as I explained using the example of a shoemaker. From that empirical fact, Marx deduced that we are therefore alienated from the activity of our labor, as I explained using the examples of extending bathroom breaks. From there, Marx advances the claim of humans as species beings to argue that, given the fact that we are alienated from our productive activity, we are, by definition, alienated from ourselves, or our nature as human beings. This is an unbroken chain of argumentation deducing truths from the initial empirical fact of our estrangement from what we create under capitalism. Now, having caught up, Marx makes his final move. He argues that the immediate consequence of the fact that we are estranged from our labor, our life activity, and from our species being is the estrangement or alienation from other people. What applies to our relationship to what we create, our relationship to our work, and our relationship to ourselves also holds of our relationship to other human beings. After all, if we are all alienated from our natures, then we are almost by definition alienated from one another. By turning our species being into an individual pursuit of our own individual means of sustenance, we turn away from each other. We stop viewing one another as fellow members of our species and we begin to see them in terms of the relations of production which hold under capitalism. The other becomes a co-worker, a boss, an employee, a competitor, and ceases to be a part of ourselves, of our common nature. After laying out the four types of alienation the worker under capitalism experiences, Marx turns to wondering how this fact of alienated labor expresses and presents itself in real life. He asks, quote, If the product of labor is alien to me, if it confronts me as an alien power, to whom then does it belong? And he answers, 
to a being other than myself. So who is this being? Well, the alien being to whom labor and the products of labor belong, the being in whose service labor is done and for whose benefit the product of labor is provided, can only be man himself. For if the product of labor does not belong to the worker, it must belong to some person other than the worker. If the worker's activity is a torment to him, it must give satisfaction and pleasure to someone else, or else why would we be forced to do it? If our activity is unfree and coerced, it must be made unfree and coerced by someone. That someone else is the capitalist, and private property is therefore the product, the result, and the necessary consequence of alienated labor. By starting his analysis, not from a just-so story made up by the political economists, but from the actual empirical fact of alienated labor, the logic leads inexorably to the relations of production where someone is alienated from their labor and someone else benefits from this alienation, which, in turn, is shown to be rooted in the existence of private property. In actual fact, Marx argues that alienated labor is the necessary prerequisite for private property, which then turns around and reproduces alienation. In summary, whereas the political economists of Marx's time root private property in some fanciful story like John Locke's Apple Orchard or some other thought experiment, Marx starts with an empirical economic fact and follows a series of logical deductions to arrive at the cause of private property, our alienation. Marx wraps up this section with this quote. We now understand that political economy has merely formulated the laws of alienated labor. We also understand that wages and private property are identical. The wage is but a necessary consequence of labor's alienation. Labor does not appear as an end in itself, but as the servant of the wage. An enforced increase of wages would therefore be nothing but better payment for the slave, and would not win, either for the worker or for labor, their human status and dignity. Wages are a direct consequence of alienated labor, and alienated labor is the direct cause of private property. The downfall of the one must therefore involve the downfall of the other. From the relationship of estranged labor to private property, it follows that the emancipation of society from private property is expressed in the political form of the emancipation of the workers. Not that their emancipation alone is at stake, but because the emancipation of the workers contains universal human emancipation. And it contains this because the whole of human servitude is involved in the relation of the worker to production. And all relations of servitude are but modifications and consequences of this relation. End quote. All right, so now we're going to go ahead and move into the final part of the book. So Marx begins his third manuscript by reflecting on the way that political economy has reconceptualized private property, and in this process has also kind of reconceptualized mankind. He points out the way that political economists understand mankind as a creature which does not exist external to or incidental to the world of private property, but rather is inherently bound up with private property because of mankind's own necessary engagement in labor. In this sense, mankind is no longer external to private property, but is recognized as its essence. This move ultimately reinforces a sort of alienating denial of mankind by reducing the species to a relation to private property, a relation marked by tension and turmoil. Marx notes that the conception of private property as being located within mankind itself carries with it a sort of universalist appeal. It subordinates all other politics, national interests, and local conditions to the reality of labor and private property. And in this sense, while claiming to have finally understood mankind as an economic animal, the political economists deny the reality of individual humans as well as any sort of independent human existence outside of labor and property. Marx writes that, quote, these later economists also advance in a positive sense constantly and consciously further than their predecessors and their estrangement from man. They do so, however, only because their science develops more consistently and truthfully, because they make private property in its active form the subject, thus simultaneously turning man into its essence, and at the same time turning man as non-essentially into the essence. The contradiction of reality corresponds completely to the contradictory being which they accept as their principle, end quote. 
So this move towards recognizing the dominance of private property is recognized by advancements in political economy, which note the outdated relations of feudal agriculture, and which recognize the conditions created by the domination of industry. All of this comes from the rise of industrialism, and political economists are taking note of this. So Marx concludes this very short first section of the manuscript by writing that, quote, All wealth has become industrial wealth. The wealth of labor and industry is accomplished labor, just as the factory system is the perfected essence of industry, that is, of labor, and just as industrial capital is the accomplished objective form of private property. We can now see how it is only at this point that private property can complete its dominion over man and become, in its most general form, a world historic power, end quote. So, having outlined sort of this view on private property and its relationship to humanity and the views of the political economists, Marx next turns to the question of communism in relation to private property. And here he begins to develop an explicitly dialectical analysis of private property. He acknowledges that the political economists have come to understand private property as an expression of labor, but he points out that they don't understand the contradictions within the relations of private property between labor and property itself. Marx explains that, quote, the antithesis between lack of property and property is in fact the antithesis between labor and capital, end quote. So private property within it contains the seeds of the contradiction that we recognize in capitalism between those who own private property and those who sell their labors uh, to those who do own private property. So the antithesis of these two forces is established through the regime of private property. Let's take a second and assess exactly what this means, because this language is all somewhat complex. Under the regime of private property, those who do not own private property, i.e. the workers, must sell their labor in exchange for wage, whereas those who own private property are spared from labor and instead work towards the accumulation of capital. In this sense, private property itself necessarily establishes this contradiction as its own internal relationship. This is built into capitalist social relations. In response to this failure to fully understand and grasp this contradiction, political economists have failed to truly understand what exactly is wrong with private property. Marx criticizes Proudhon for placing the blame on, quote, capital as such, rather than on property, and notes that utopian socialists like Fourier and Saint-Simon locate specific forms of labor as the key problem. In contrast to these limited views, Marx turns to an analysis of communism, looking at three potential forms of communism in order to figure out what the correct form would be. The first type of communism that Marx analyzes is what he calls a crude communism, which seeks a universalization of private property rather than an abolition of it. This crude communism is merely, quote, a generalization and consummation of private property, end quote, and wants to bring everything possible under the domain of private property while throwing out anything that does not fit under this domain, such as individual notions of personality and talent. The condition which produces the workers in relation to property are not undone, but are rather universalized as private property becomes a universal reality. This form of communism, Marx asserts, is merely a form of envy for the possessions of the capitalist class, rather than a resolution to the contradiction imposed by the regime of property. This form of communism, by leaving private property intact, assures only a weak egalitarianism, wherein all that is assured is, quote, the equality of wages paid out by communal capitalism, by the community as the universal capitalist, end quote. As such, this crude communism is not a break from private property itself, but an expression of it. All it can do is create a crude leveling and form of egalitarianism, and can never actually rupture capitalism and resolve the contradiction that private property imposes. Marx very briefly then describes a second form of communism as containing the, quote, abolition of the state, yet still incomplete and being still affected by private property, i.e. by the estrangement of man, end quote. In the second form of communism, there's a move to free mankind from the estrangement of capitalism, but the way that this estrangement is produced through private property is still not yet understood, keeping this time of communism bound by the regime of private property as well. So, having outlined these two sort of incorrect understandings of communism, Marx finally describes a third form of communism. We must quote this description at length. He refers to this communism as, quote, the positive transcendence of private property as human self-estrangement, and therefore as the real appropriation of human essence by and for man. Communism, therefore, as the complete return of man to himself as a social being, a return accomplished consciously and embracing the entire wealth of the previous development. This communism is as fully developed naturalism equals humanism, and as fully developed humanism equals naturalism. It is the genuine resolution of the conflict between man and nature and between man and man. The true resolution of strife between existence and essence, between objectification and self-confirmation, between freedom and necessity, between the individual and the 
species. Communism is the riddle of history solved, and it knows itself to be the solution." End quote. This communism doesn't ground itself in some sort of reactionary return to older forms of life before capitalism, nor does it seek historical examples of its existence like crude communism does. Rather, it understands itself as emerging as a process of historical development. There's no attempt to return to a time before private property, but rather recognition that private property has illuminated the material reality of humankind's life in relation to production. As a result of this materialist focus, it recognizes that, quote, religion, family, state, law, morality, science, art, etc. are only particular modes of production and fall under its general law, end quote. Given this realization, this third form of communism grasps that freedom from religious estrangement is not enough because it's a freedom which only happens at the level of consciousness whereas freedom from economic estrangement happens at the level of material reality. In this sense, Marx goes beyond the young Hegelians who had a critique of religion from an atheistic perspective as their critique of society to a materialist criticism that looks at the material base of reality as well as the ideological superstructure. As such, this communism embraces an atheistic perspective in advocated by many critics of Marx's time, but it moves beyond that atheistic perspective, recognizing that material rather than abstract philosophical estrangement must be combated and that such estrangement arises from particular material conditions. Not only does this understanding of communism reorient from an abstract philosophical ideal to an economic and material reality, it also takes shape as a specifically human reality. In this text, we see Marx's humanism come out very strongly. This materialist conception of communism, understood through an economic account of private property, grants insight into mankind's own identity and the relationship between humans as individuals and humans as species. Marx writes that, quote, we have seen how, on the assumption of positively annulled private property, man produces man, himself and the other man, how the object, being the direct manifestation of his individuality, is simultaneously his own existence for the other man, the existence of the other man, and that existence for him, end quote. Now, as you can probably tell, Marx is particularly interested in understanding the relationship between the individual and the species, or in society, in this text. And because the text is an early manuscript rather than a, com a completed work, his thought process often meanders a little bit. He seems here in this manuscript to transition away from discussing this third form of communism directly to a broader theoretical reflection on the relation between individual and species. Marx increasingly emphasizes that the actions of individual people are only comprehensible as a part of a social whole, because they express the actions of a being whose existence is necessarily in the first place social. Marx rejects the idea of a clear distinction between the individual and the social, arguing that the actions of the individual can only be conceptualized as a specific instance of the actions of the species. He writes that, quote, man's individual and species life are not different, however much, and this is inevitable, the mode of existence of the individual is a more particular and general mode of the life of the species, or the life of the species is a more particular or general individual life, end quote. Not only has a more thorough exploration of economics shed light on the relationship between the individual human and species, showing how the society and the individual are not actually at odds with each other, Marx also argues that this outlook has demystified scientific attempts to understand man by relating religion, science, sense perceptions, and other expressions of human activities as manifest in the economic life of humanity. This materialist understanding of humanity reveals that, quote, the entire so-called history of the world is nothing but the creation of man through human labor." End quote. So having investigated the meaning of communism in relation to private property, Marx turns to an investigation of how human need is conceptualized and constructed under capitalism. Thankfully, things get a bit more grounded and easier to understand here. Marx explains that within capitalism, there's a desire to create a sense of need in other people. He writes that, quote, every person speculates on creating a new need in another so as to drive him to fresh sacrifice, to place him in a new dependence and seduce him into a new mode of enjoyment and therefore economic ruin, end quote. This need expresses itself as the need for money under capitalist society. Money abstracts everything to a form of economic exchange and the endless need to accumulate more money in order to be able to afford to live, begins to dominate human activity. 
capitalists and their own endless demand for money create products to sell which are designed to entice other people into spending their own money. There is thus a generalized exploitation which emerges from this dynamic. This perversion of need plays out in really horrific ways as well. Marx notes that capitalism removes the workers' need for fresh air, forcing workers into unclean and overcrowded dwellings, while demanding that the worker pay for this alien and inhumane dwelling. For the workers, money is spent not to create human thriving, but to achieve the most basic and horrific conditions of survival. Marx writes that, quote, a dwelling in the light, which Prometheus and Aeschylus des designated as one of the greatest boons by means of which he can make the savage into a human being, ceases to exist for the worker. Light, air, etc., the simplest animal cleanliness, ceases to be a need for man. Filth, the stagnation and putrefication of man, the sewage of civilization, comes to be the element of life for him. Utter, unnatural deprivation, putrefied nature, comes to be his life element. End quote. And capitalism thus functions to redefine human need from the conditions of human thriving to the most bare-bone conditions for survival. Capitalism denies a need for enjoyment for the workers, only biological survival matters. And this reduction of need to mere survival explains quite well the reasons that people judge the poor for engaging in anything approximating luxury. We've heard people talk about, oh, if you're poor, how can you afford Starbucks or a cell phone? Why don't you live more simply? This attitude is explained by Marx. He writes that the capitalist changes the worker into an uh, insensible being, lacking all needs, just as he changes his activity into a pure abstraction from all activity. To him, therefore, every luxury of the worker seems to be reprehensible. And everything that goes beyond the most abstract need, be it in the realm of passive enjoyment or a manifestation of activity, seems to him a luxury. End quote. So workers then get told to live frugally, to save, to avoid decadence, and to accept their horrific place in the capitalist social structure. In contrast to this bare-bones existence of the workers, capitalism develops another version of need for the rich. The rich begin to desire increasingly obscure and luxurious goods, elevated above basic human need. This luxury is only for the rich minority, however, and should not be seen as symbolic of capitalism more broadly. The generalized condition of squalor is not only the more common reality, it's also the more economically important. Marx again writes that, quote, The meaning which production has in relation to the rich is seen revealed in the meaning which it has for the poor. Looking upwards, the manifestation is always refined, veiled, ambiguous, outward appearance. Downwards, it's rough, straightforward, frank, the real thing. The worker's crude need is a far greater source of gain than the refined need of the rich. The cellar dwellings in London bring more to those who let them than do the plate palaces. That is to say, with reference to the landlord, they constitute greater wealth, and thus greater social wealth. End quote. And so for Marx, this reconstruction of human need to bare-bones survival is not only a horrific thing imposed upon the workers, but is a source of profit for the landlords among the capitalist class. So money not only creates a division between what constitutes need for the workers versus need for the rich, according to Marx, it also becomes a dominating force within capitalist society, asserting a sort of absolute primacy. Capitalism creates a system wherein the possession and acquiring of objects is a central activity for mankind, and these objects have to be acquired through transaction. This system creates a world in which money is central, as money possesses, quote, the property of appropriating all objects. Money is thus the object of eminent possession. The universality of its property is the omnipotence of its being. It is therefore regarded as an omnipotent being. Money is the procurer between man's need and the object, between his life and his means of life. But that which mediates my life for me also mediates the existence of other people for me. End quote. And so Marx touches on this idea of an omnipotence, an ability to do anything for money, which he expands upon in an interesting bit of literary analysis. Marx turns to a quote from the poet Goethe, wherein the poet declares, quote, Six stallions say I can afford. Is not their strength my property? I tear along a sporting lord as if their legs belong to me. End quote. Marx interprets this quote as saying that the power of the human individual is their purchasing power. In short, quote, the extent of the power of money is the extent of my power. Money's properties are my possessors, properties and essential powers, end quote. The properties of the individual thus become irrelevant, and the individual aspect of a given purpose can be circumvented through the power of money. Marx points to the example of a particularly ugly man who can buy sex as an instance of this circumvention. 
Practically, this means that money has given power to the ugly man to make him functionally beautiful. As the effects of ugliness are negated by the power of money, this is the all-powerful, omnipotent power of money that Marx talks about. He writes, quote, I am bad, dishonest, unscrupulous, stupid, but money is honored and hence its possessor. Money is the supreme good, therefore its possessor is good. Money besides saves me the trouble of being dishonest. I am therefore presumed honest, end quote. Money thus takes on the ability to transform those who possess it. It also takes on the role of determining and mediating human connection. Money is the connection between the individual and society. It is, according to Marx, quote, the bond of all bonds, end quote. So likewise, money can dissolve bonds. A lack of money can exclude one from society and dissolve relationships that were themselves based merely on the transfer of wealth and of money between two people. So Marx concludes the economic section of this third manuscript by reflecting on this sort of terrible power of money. He writes, Since money, as the existing and active concept of value, confounds and confuses all things, it is the general confounding and confusing of all things. The world upside down, the confounding and confusing of all natural and human qualities. He who can buy bravery is brave, though he be a coward. As money is not exchanged for any one specific quality, for any one specific thing, and for any particular human essential power, but for the entire objective world of man and nature, from the standpoint of its possessor, it therefore serves to exchange every quality for every other, even contradictory quality and object. It is the fraternization of impossibilities it makes contradictions embrace." End quote. In contrast to this, Marx suggests that if we understand humanity as humanity itself, not mediated through money, if we understand humanity's relation to the world to be human rather than economic, then we can imagine connections in which one cannot buy love, but must have a mutual exchange of love. In such a world, one's own personality, individuality, and abilities would dictate how one could interact with the world around them. Such a world, however, no longer exists. For better or for worse, capitalism has led to the development of money as an all-powerful distorter of such relations. We are left with some amount of ambiguity regarding whether this is a good or bad development. Marx uses rather monstrous and horrific language to describe this distortion, but at the same time he stops short of perhaps a full-blown normative critique instead describing a process in strong and evocative terms. And it's in space of this ambiguity that we'll conclude our examination of Marx's third manuscript. All right, now we are entering part two, and this is where we basically ask one another discussion questions and sort of have a little back and forth trying to reflect on the text that we just explained and summarize. So I'll ask the first question to you, Allison. And the question is, Marx is very careful to point out that communism is not an undoing of capitalist relations or a return to the past. Communism emerges from capitalism and creates something new from the conditions capitalism itself has brought into existence. What is at stake in this distinction between a nostalgic form of communism and a future-oriented one? Yeah, so this is a part of the text that I think is interesting, and I think when we look at the historical development of these two approaches to communism, we see some interesting things. So I think that this question sort of raises, like, a broader question, which is, if, like, we are opposed to capitalism, does it matter from what angle we're opposed to it, and what alternative we're offering? And Marx seems to suggest, especially in the third manuscript, that it does matter quite a bit. He critiques a sort of nostalgic communism that looks back to previous modes of life as evidence for the possibility ability of communism. And he also critiques sort of this crass communism that he sees as not adequately uh, sort of pushing through capitalist relations and universalizing certain aspects of them. So for Marx in this text, it's very important that when we are proposing communism as an alternative to capitalism, this isn't just an undoing of parts of capitalism or a return to a time before capitalism. It's developing the progressive aspects of capitalism into something more meaningful, more universal, and capable of overcoming alienation. So the proof of communism's possibility, according to Marx, then, isn't found in past historical projects or formulations, not even of the utopian socialists, but in the conditions that capitalism itself has brought into existence. So again, why does this matter? Well, a nostalgic approach to capitalism can kind of lead to an emergence of reactionary ideals in a lot of ways. So let's think about it like this. 
the aristocratic class that had a lot of power during the late feudal era, for example, was definitely pushed out of power and displaced by merchants because of capitalist republicanism. So surely these aristocrats, you know, would have an opposition to capitalism that is a nostalgic longing for a prior order. But that nostalgic desire for a proper order isn't necessarily progressive, and in fact it can be outright reactionary. So I think that this might explain why we saw the European bourgeoisie ally themselves with sort of racist and nationalist syndicalists and radicals in the development of the Nazi party and the National Fascist Party in Italy. There were people who were anti-capitalist in a sense. They wanted to return to something before capitalism, to undo something that capitalism had done, but this ultimately led them to creating a reactionary movement that created massive amounts of violence and arguably actually just defended capitalism from socialist revolution. So these people had real reason to hate capitalism, but this spun out into reaction because capitalism was seen as a process which could be reversed, rather than something to be pushed through and transcended, which is the Marxist position. So part of the problem I think that Marx touches on is this worry that a nostalgic approach to communism potentially sets us up for a reactionary politics. And while I think this is an important concern, I also want to note that more contemporary theorists have pushed back about this part of Marx, and I think that we should give them some thought. So Silvia Federici, for example, questions the idea that capitalist republicanism and industrial development was actually a necessary step for communism to come about in some way or another. And instead, she points to sort of these past communal peasant movements to argue that the bourgeois revolution was actually a counter-revolution against a sort of egalitarian agrarian socialism that could have emerged at that time. So for Federici, actually, she suggests that we do look back almost nostalgically on these peasant movements as a source for inspiration, in a sense, that could have shown us a different way to communism that didn't have to develop all the way through capitalist social relations. So Federici here is challenging Marx's idea that communism has to emerge through capitalism. And personally, I break from Federici here, I think. This is an interesting counterfactual reading of history. It's an interesting what if, but I don't know how politically useful it is, given that those peasant projects don't exist anymore, and the conditions in which they operated have been thoroughly destroyed by capitalism at this point. Meaning that even if it was possible at that point for us to move into another form of socialism, it probably no longer is. We have to go through capitalism now. But it is worth noting that some historians who work within the Marxist tradition have pushed back against Marx on this question, and maybe have made a defense of somewhat of a nostalgic move, despite the reactionary potential of that move. On the other hand, I also think it's worth recognizing that indigenous theorists have also criticized Marx for this view, arguing that the communistic ideals did exist prior to capitalism, and that resistance uh, to capitalism and colonialism by indigenous people has been an ongoing process that has preserved other ways of life. And many Marxists really have adopted a very unfortunate chauvinist attitude and dismissed this ongoing resistance and a project of decolonization as a nostalgic desire to return to a time before capitalism and colonialism. Uh, but in, in this instance, I'm going to have to say that I really find myself breaking with the orthodox Marxists on this question. It seems to me that the indigenous critics of Marxism have found a limit to Marx's belief in the linear progressive movement of capitalist development, and kind of have it demonstrated that indigenous ways of life were never totally wiped out. In this sense, because those ways of life have existed through forms of resistance, it may not totally be a form of nostalgic communism, but it certainly is a form of communism that looks to past existing examples in a way that Marx dismisses in this text. So I think given that reality, Marxists want to dismiss decolonial perspectives as nostalgic, but this move is a little problematic. I think this dismissal kind of stems from a failure to adapt our Marxist analysis to a more thorough and materialist understanding of colonization. So on the question of a nostalgic versus a future-oriented communism, there's certainly risks of the nostalgic move, but I also think there's a lot of room to criticize sort of the linear theory of progress that Marx holds in this text when he analyzes communism. Yeah, I think that is incredibly well said and, and well articulated. It's so funny because in the first part of your answer, I wrote down, you know, like Federici critiques of capitalism <laughs> as a progressive force. Then you tackled it. And as you were tackling that, I was writing down, what about the indigenous perspective? And then you tackled that. <laughs> so I don't really have any feedback because all my feedback were already addressed in, uh, in your answer. So, yeah, well done. And I completely actually totally agree with that. Uh, really nuanced and, and well thought out for sure. Um, but, yeah, the next two questions I think are going to deal with humanism. I think I'll deal with sort of a, a basic uh, approach to it, and then Allison will dive a little bit deeper into it. So I know we've talked about humanism <laughs> in the past. I think we're finally going to fully sort of come to the culmination of our discussions on these uh, topics today, hopefully. So if you want to go to the next question, Allison. Awesome. Yeah, I definitely think this will set us up to really get into this. So 
In past episodes of both Rev Left Radio and Red Menace, we've discussed Marxist humanism and uh, Althusser's anti-humanism, in which Althusser makes a separation between the young Marx, as found in this text, and the older and mature Marx, arguing that the humanism of the early Marx is really irrelevant to Marxism. So we need not get all of that here, but for those who are following along, how is this text an example of Marxist humanism? What about Marx's arguments here make it a humanist work? Okay, so, you know, humanism, it can take many different forms. It can take reactionary forms, liberal forms, and revolutionary forms. But broadly speaking, humanism is any philosophy which asserts a, a common trait that all humans share and which attaches a special importance to human beings specifically based on those commonly shared traits. An example I often give in order to kind of both highlight and mock the liberal form of humanism is that well-known infamous picture of Richard Dawkins wearing a shirt that says, we are all Africans. The juxtaposition of Dawkins' white-ass face, not to mention his class status, with the idea that he is an African is hilarious and nauseating in its total blindness to actual racial and class relationships, particularly between European colonial powers and the continent of Africa. As an aside, if you want to pursue that criticism, I'd urge people to check out Walter Rodney's famous work, How Europe Underdeveloped Africa. But the point here is that Dawkins' liberal humanism attempts to tie all of humanity together by reference to our shared ancestry, our common evolutionary lineage as homo sapiens. What is ostensibly supposed to be deduced from that is that despite our outward differences, we are all the same on the inside. Now, experiencing this rather crude form of humanism certainly makes it susceptible to criticism from a million different angles, but it is a good example of one form of humanism and hopefully helps clarify what is meant by it. For Marx, however, his humanism lies primarily in his work on alienation for two main reasons. One is that Marx is diagnosing a subjective condition of all human beings under capitalism, or namely all workers under capitalism. Namely, a deep internal sense of estrangement from our work, from ourselves, and from one another. The second reason lies in his formulation of the concept of species being, which is an argument positing a universal human nature, namely that it is our nature to be freely creative beings with the capacity of stepping back from our own life activity and consciously reflecting on it in pursuit of creating a world in our own image. In both cases, Marx is asserting a common and universal humanity, something we experience and something we are by virtue of being human beings. He also argues that the emancipation of the worker entails what he calls, quote, universal human emancipation. The working class in this context is not simply an inhuman historical force opposed to another inhuman historical force, but is the vehicle through which all of humanity will be liberated, both objectively and subjectively. This importantly includes the capitalist who, in some ways at least, is just as much a victim or at least just as much dominated by the system as the workers are, but because of their relatively privileged and dominant position, they become a force of repression, not ever a force of emancipation. Now, anti-humanists like Althusser would argue that all of this talk of alienation and subjectivity and species being is, at best, unnecessary flourishes on top of an empirical understanding of capital and history, and at worst, a red herring which needlessly subjectivizes what are otherwise purely objective historical processes and thus confuses people. In my opinion, while I see the intervention that Althusser made here to be an important one, given the fact that if humanism is embraced to the exclusion of more scientific and structuralist approaches, it can weaken our analysis of capitalism and thus hinder our ability to overcome it, I ultimately think that Marx's humanism, when situated properly, can actually complement the rest of his work. I would argue there is, of course, a dialectical relationship between the objective outside world and the subjective internal experience of that world. And furthermore, when we are trying to rally the working class to our cause in an attempt to make our class a class for itself, which is conscious of its historical role, emphasizing the subjective harm done by capitalism can often be an important and effective doorway into those discussions. From a purely strategic perspective, I think this talk of alienation is incredibly relatable to working people, even to people who have no real grasp on the broader critique that Marxism offers. It's a means by which we can directly access and relate to people's internal experiences, and once that foothold is obtained, we can then branch out to other, perhaps more fundamental, elements of the Marxist critique and understanding. 
In any case, I hope that helps people at least understand this broader argument between humanism and anti-humanism within Marxism, regardless of where they themselves ultimately come down on the topic. Now, instead of immediately getting your feedback on that, would you like me just to go into the next question since it is sort of a response and elaboration? Yeah, let's go ahead and do that. Okay, so my, my uh, question back towards you, Allison, is obviously this is a text where we see Marxist humanism bleeding through very clearly. While there is a certain poetic beauty to this humanism, there have also been many critics of this humanism. Why are some theorists so concerned about the implications of this outlook? Awesome. So yeah, I think you hinted at some of Althusser's concerns about this, and we can go ahead and get into this with a little bit more depth. So one thing that I think is worth looking at is that what's at stake in the question of humanism is really sort of like, what is the core criticism of Marxism? So on the one hand, Marx's humanism, humanist critique found in this text can seem like almost an ethical critique of capitalism, right? He's giving us sort of like normative categories to think about why capitalism is problematic, not just economically, but subjectively and in how it perverts and distorts human life. So his analysis of capitalism's contradiction stops short of his later, more economic perspective, wherein the fall of capitalism feels like a sort of an inevitability as a result of its own contradictions. And we can oppose capitalism on a purely scientific grounds, absent an ethical framework. So that sort of later development isn't so present in this text. Here we see Marx in a lot of ways as a normative theorist of sorts. He's horrified at what capitalism has done to human nature and the alienation it has created between humanity and nature, as well as humanity and themselves. And this plays through in strong language of shock that does evoke almost an ethical or a moral horror. At the end of this text, we might think of Marx as a moral or ethical critique of capitalism's violence, both in terms of material violence and its perversion of human consciousness. And I think, Brett, you touched really well on why that's particularly useful from a propagandistic standpoint, but we can maybe get into some of the difficulties with this. Now, on the other hand, there's another view of Marxism, which we do not see the same appeals to humanism in much of the rest of Marx's work, especially his later work. So instead, we see a theory of capitalism that notes the inherent instability of capitalism, its constant tendency towards crisis, and which theorizes the fall of capitalism not as an ethical or a normative concern, but as an economic like inevitability given capitalism's own contradictions. So we might think of a very extreme form of this if we think back to Engels' emphasis in socialism, utopian, and scientific, in which there's very little talk of individual consciousness of the worker, but instead an analysis of the contradiction between socialized productive forces on the one hand and individual ownership and appropriation on the other. So in Engels, actually, it goes maybe too far in the other direction. We almost lose sight of the proletariat altogether given the focus on more abstract economic contradictions. And here we can see a version of Marxism that isn't a normative ethical critique, but is almost just kind of a detached scientific analysis of capitalism. And so the question of humanism poses this question for us, I think, of which is it? Is Marxism an ethical critique of capitalism, or is Marxism a scientific view of capitalism that necessarily notes the inevitability of capitalism's fall? So which of these represents the best understanding of Marxism? So I personally argue in line with Althusser that it's the later view. I don't think we need to take up humanism much outside this text, and I would argue that really if we look at Marx's other work, we see him abandon his humanism in a lot of ways. Uh, one text that's very useful to look at that Althusser points to to some extent is the theses on Feuerbach, this very short set of theses where Marx is critiquing Feuerbach's work, and Marx critiques Feuerbach for, quote, resolving the religious essence into the human essence, end quote, and treating a human essence as a static thing that is universal. And he says, in fact, the human essence is nothing more than the ensemble of social relations. Therefore, it is prone to change and development. There's not a human essence that one could be alienated from, per se, because there's no essence which extends outside a given historical moment. So I would argue that Marx even then criticizes Feuerbach in his later work for maintaining a belief in a human universal condition. And I should suggest that this means that Marx is probably throwing out his idea of species being that he's employing in this text so thoroughly. So on the one hand, I think that Marx does just shift away from this, and Althusser makes a good case that over time Marx develops his own ideas. But in addition to this, I think there's external reasons that we could be skeptical of a humanist and ethical critique. So I think that a humanist approach to things that makes normative claims can really frame resistance to capitalism as an ethical matter, wherein one's ethical intentions are the important factor that must be considered, not one's relations to the masses and to production. It can also cause us to really turn away from 
from allies within the capitalist class who might betray their class interests. If anti-capitalism is a normative, ethical, humanist project, then those who have put themselves in the positions of capitalists while being hurt by alienation in their own way also have sort of made a decision to be a part of this horrific system of alienation. And if we were to adopt that view, we might then have to demand, for example, that Engels abandon his position within capitalism and give up his inheritance on a normative ethical ground. But obviously, if that were the case, we would never have had the writing of Marx because Engels' position within the capitalist class and his betrayal of it was necessary for Marxist writing to occur at all. So ethical accounts, I think, can create a sort of dogmatism that can be an impediment to building a revolutionary movement, whereas a maybe more detached scientific account allows us to you know, be more comfortable in ethical and normative gray areas in order to meet revolutionary needs. Furthermore, I think the focus on alienation from human essence can really lead to a lot of forms of reactionary. So on the one hand, it can lead to the type of nostalgia that Marx is concerned about, I think. It's the kind of language that we see from like a lot of religious critics of capitalism, where they talk about the way that capitalism has alienated us from a human essence that is transcendent of history and is put in place by God or something or another. And while Marx doesn't make that theistic move, he does kind of have this transhistorical conception of a human essence, which were alienated from. In addition to this, I think that this discussion of alienation gets taken up by fascists as well. Fascists in many ways were revolutionaries, while ultimately the revolutionary wing of the Nazi party was ousted in favor of the aristocratic wing, there were racist anti-Semitic revolutionaries who wanted to overthrow what they understood capitalism to be precisely because it alienated us from nature, it alienated us from folk, it alienated us from a real sense of community. And so I think it's very easy for this language alienation that is built into humanism to get taken up by reactionaries, and might be a reason even that some fascists had a background within Marxism and had a background within socialist politics before moving over into an idealistic and ahistorical conception of things, and I worry that the language of alienation can make that easier. So that's one potential concern that I think we really have to take into account. But at the same time, I also think it's important to remember that the scientific approach can get too detached. We can lose sight of the workers as people. We can lose sight of the real suffering of capitalism, and it can cause us to become callous and cold. I think you do almost really see that play out in Engels' text in a problematic way. So at the very least, the humanist use might be a nice counterbalance in some sense to help us think about what capitalism is experienced like for individuals, but I don't think it can be the core of our capitalist critique, and I don't think it's necessary to have a critical orientation on capitalism. Yeah, so I think that's all very convincing, and, you know, ex I mean, as long as there is some role to play propagandistically, or maybe if it's the, the humanist or ethical critiques are fully and, you know, methodically subordinated to the scientific understanding, then it might have some role to play, but your whole um, point about fascism is really interesting. I hadn't fully thought through that, but you're right. I mean, you, you hear people like Richard Spencer, you know, like, like uh, trads, like tradcaths use this sort of language at times. Eco-fascists certainly use this sort of um, rhetoric at times, these sort of more humanist appeals or whatever. The, the whole construction of how Marx put together his idea of species being, I think does open him up to a lot of critiques. I mean, as I was reading through it, just from somebody, especially with the philosophical training, you can immediately start picking apart what he means by it, and that whole thing can collapse. And in this text, he's really deducing private property from alienation and if and if we lose some of those major planks like species being then you know it really is much harder for the marxist critique to gain any traction and i do find that i'm able to reach regular people like with this alienation stuff because it speaks so clearly to their experience it it really like it's sort of will, will get people's attention really well like whoa, like, you know, when, when, when you can really articulate alienation to a working person, it connects with them in an immediate, intuitive way that I, I find hard to completely let go of. And again, I don't think you're advocating a complete letting go. So maybe I think we're pretty much in agreement here where as long as it's subordinated to the broader critique, the scientific critique, as long as we're aware of the pitfalls that come with overemphasizing the ethical and humanist dimension of these things, that it can have a, a role to play, but it, it can't be the whole thing and it certainly can't be the core or the fundamentals of our approach as Marxists.
Right. And I definitely think, like, the propagandistic part is key. Like you said, like, when I have talked to people who have never interacted with Marxism before, it's the concept of alienation that they're immediately like, oh, I know what that feels like. Like, there's a very quick recognition of it. So it plays a very powerful role in that sense, I think. And it also, like, what kind of propaganda is it to look to someone who's suffering and be like, hey, did you know you're part of this broader historical movement of socialized labor of which you as an individual are irrelevant? Right. (laughs) Obviously, is not a very good way to convince anybody (laughs) that you have a politics which you can offer them. So I definitely think if we get rid of any sort of tension to the subjective consciousness aspect of capitalism, we lose an ability to recruit, and we also just kind of sound like fucking weirdos. (laughs) In a way that can be very difficult to deal with. Yeah, definitely. And there are elements of the left, especially recently, that, I mean, not just the Marxist left, but, you know, liberal left, etc., that do take this sort of moralistic tone all the time and they're always moralizing to other people and and that is incredibly grating and and if we do have some benefit of using this stuff propagandistically it is completely lost once people feel like they're constantly being moralized and spoken down to so that is another error of taking this shit too far um just the entire ethical component you know it has to be i think subordinated to uh to the broader scientific understanding for sure definitely all right you want to get to the next question let's do it Cool. So in what ways does Marx's analysis in this text help us understand current political events, specifically people's responses to things like the Great Recession or automation? So after that critique of humanism, I'm going right back to subjectivity. <laughs> so in the second manuscript, which is you know only recovered in part, in which I didn't cover in the summary, um, we can find some of these answers. And to do that, let me lay out some some quotes from that section by Marx himself. So there's four just little snippets, quotes um, from Marx. The worker is the subjective manifestation of the fact that capital is man wholly lost to himself. The worker produces capital, capital produces the worker. Hence, he produces himself as a worker, as a commodity. This is the product of the entire cycle. Next quote. As soon as it occurs to capital to no longer be for the worker, he himself is no longer himself. He has no work, hence no wages. And as he has no existence as a human being, but only as a worker under capitalism, he can go and bury himself, starve to death, etc. And finally, the abstract existence of man as a mere worker means he may therefore fall from his filled void into the absolute void, i.e. into his social and therefore actual non-existence. Now, what is Marx saying here? Well, he is saying that under capitalism, and importantly in the eyes of the political economists he was critiquing, working class human beings are nothing but their labor. Political economy, or as we know it today, economics, really has no place for the non-working human in its analysis other than as a data point in the unemployment numbers. The moment, therefore, that a person becomes unproductive, rather through an inability to find a job, through a disability which prevents them from working, or from any other scenario, they cease to exist as a social being, as a member of society worth paying attention to. Workers internalize this, and thus tie their self-conception to their productivity and status within the capitalist hierarchy. And if you think about it, it explains a lot. For example, look at the opioid epidemic in America. It is strongest in those places which used to have good manufacturing jobs, but now, since free trade agreements like NAFTA and other forces of globalized capital have taken over, those jobs no longer exist. Well, what is left for someone who, for generations, formed their self-conception through their work when that work dries up and disappears? And in its place are presented fast food jobs or other low-paying service industry jobs. The answer is right in front of us. The psychology of the worker collapses in on itself. It has no capacity to imagine itself outside its position as a worker in the capitalist system, and so people escape through the abuse of drugs or through suicide. We are seeing this play out empirically in front of our eyes all over the country. This same basic logic applies to things like automation and the UBI. In the case of automation, people are increasingly being forced to compete with high-tech machines. Think of a truck driver staring down the barrel of self-driving cars. Who is that person when what he defines himself by gets stripped from him and the thing he prided himself on is done better by a bloodless machine? Or consider the UBI. The thing that proponents of the UBI miss is the psychological cost of people no longer being able to identify themselves as a productive member of society. If given the chance to get cut a $1,000 check every month or to have meaningful, productive work that gives a person a sense that they are contributing and providing for their families, most people will choose the latter. 
Take that choice away from them, and people suffer enormously. It might be okay for some basement-dwelling gamers, but for most people, myself included, a UBI in a vacuum does nothing but obscure the real problem and therefore creates more psychological harm while allowing for the continued existence of the capitalist system overall, the very thing that creates the problem the UBI is trying to address in the first place. Let's look at street gangs and impoverished neighborhoods. When there is no real life opportunities, when the only chances of being someone of any real status are winning the lottery of a sports or entertainment career, when the possibilities of advancement just don't exist in your community, what do people do? Well, lots of different things, but one reaction, and an understandable one to some degree, is a total rejection of the society that put them in this position, and a burning sense of self-loathing aimed outward toward the world in the form of hate or violence or crime. At least in a gang, you get some sense of community, right? Lastly, let's look at how society treats the elderly or the disabled. Since productivity is worshipped above all else, our society has little space or concern for people who aren't productive in the precise ways that the market demands. Disabled people are often flung to the fringes of society, and elderly people are packed into retirement homes, many of which are deeply underfunded or run mercilessly for profit. The human being stops mattering once that human being can no longer play its role in the market. In all of these cases, Marx's analysis helps us make sense of these people and their reactions to being forced outside the only thing in a capitalist society that is given any worth, productivity and status. When people are stripped of their very identities as productive workers in a society that says you are only worth anything insofar as you are a productive worker, people suffer deeply. This is truly an inhumane and evil setup, and it's all rooted in the logic of capitalism. Human beings no longer exist for ourselves or for one another. We exist only to serve the mode of production over which we have no control and under which we are trampled. And since we are only valued as workers, and since we build up our ideas of ourselves through our work, we often aren't even able to get to know ourselves outside that context. We aren't able to self-actualize because we aren't able to explore our creative energies outside the dictates of the market. Higher goals like love, beauty, art, and communion with nature are only valued insofar as they can be monetized. Marx points all of this out and shows clearly how it's all ultimately rooted in private property. One conclusion I take away from this is that the fight for socialism must be the active fight against the existence of private property. For so long as private property exists... According to Marx, alienation exists, human suffering exists, and the vast majority of humanity remains in chains. Allison? Yeah, I think this is fascinating, and I think it touches on what, you know, one of the things that we very much do gain from the humanist perspective that you're getting at is not just this idea that, like, only labor matters, but that, like, our identity is shaped through that by our relationship to production and that kind of society. And it reminds me of sort of in the third manuscript, right? Marx talks about sort of the destruction of the individual, not only through private property, but through the way private property makes money sort of a mediator of human interaction, Such that it's not only that I'm defined by my job, but my wages also define me too. Because if I have enough money, it doesn't matter if, you know, I am an uninteresting person. I can literally buy friendship under capitalism. It doesn't matter (laughs) if, yeah, if I'm unintelligent, I can buy an education under capitalism. And so the entire identity that we have is not just tied up in our production, but also tied up in our wages in response to that. And how those allow individuals to transform themselves through the market in a way that that only the rich have access to. And there's throughout this whole text a really interesting like focus on how identity itself is constructed by capitalism that I don't think we have the time to do it now, but could be if we wanted to maintain the humanist outlook, a really useful way of intersecting this analysis with sort of more identity politics oriented criticisms of capitalism as well. Yeah, absolutely. You know, th- th- those parts just, just really spoke to me and yeah, they, they speak to other people and it does help make a lot of sense about you know, why people react in certain ways. Like, you know, the opioid epidemic is a perfect example. So at the very least, it helps us understand these sort of psychological reactions in the broader context of a capitalist society. One thing I wanted to touch on before we move on to the next section, and this is sort of trivial, but um, I recently got an email from a listener on my um, Althuse episode Mm -hmm. just going in on me about mispronouncing (laughs) Althuse, like calling me fucking stupid and saying I'm lazy because it takes three seconds to look up how to say it. And just like really just just destroying me. And then he signed off with love the show. Solidarity. (laughs) Uh, But I just want to I just want to, um, you know, figure this out once and for all. What's the right Uh way to say it? Is it your your way? Correct. 
I, so I, it's how I always heard it in graduate school. Um, I mean, I would also suggest that French is a fundamentally stupid language. <laughs> that, you know, we should only do so much to adapt to their naming conventions. <laughs> but I, I have always heard Althusser. Uh, I'm not sure if that is the correct, but that is what I encountered in like a continental philosophy oriented graduate school when we discussed him. Okay, well, maybe I'm being a little fancy and trying to be a little too French for my own good, but noted, noted. <laughs> All right, let's go on to part three, application points. All right, so for my application question, I kind of want to recognize a difficulty about approaching this text. One difficulty of trying to understand the application of Marx's text to our current situation is that his writings are more grounded in analysis than in theorizing concrete practice. Lenin, Stalin, and Mao, they had really the privilege of already having Marx's work to reference, of already having an economic, scientific, and philosophical framework to draw on. While Lenin and Mao made advances in their development of this theory, those advancements were only possible because Marx had done so much of the abstract work ahead of time. Lenin could theorize the party, Mao could develop the mass line, and Stalin could formalize Lenin's ideas because they were actively engaged in a revolutionary moment. Much of Marx's writing is oriented around understanding the emergence of one such moment and an analysis of one, how one could be brought about. So this raises a difficult question for us studying today. The problem's not merely one of how we might apply Marx today, but also why we might choose to study Marx instead of later, more practically grounded theorists. After all, Lenin, Stalin, and Mao summarized much of Marx's work. What then is to be gained by returning to Marx? Given the difficulty of applying Marx, I want to first justify the acts of studying Marx, especially of studying his more abstract texts like the manuscripts. Really, I mean, if you were paying attention to Marx's discourse, you will find that a lot has been written about a so-called return to Marx by contemporary Marxist theorists. On a very basic level, this return to Marx has been talked about as a resurgence in the relevance of Marxist theory to contemporary conditions. So beginning in the Obama era, even, we saw that many people speculated that the recession and the emergence of the Occupy movement were responsible for a sort of theoretical turn to Marx. In a very different vein, Orthodox and anti-Leninist Marxists have also discussed a return to Marx as sort of a return to an uncorrupted pre-Leninist Marxism, free of the supposedly authoritarian corruption which emerged in the Soviet Union and Maoist China. And given this discussion of a return to Marx, perhaps these perspectives can tell us why it is worth studying Marx. And so on the one hand, the former sense of a return to Marx uh, seems to just be a matter of historical reality. There has been a reemergence of Marxism, which has occurred as a political force within American politics. Although from my perspective, this emergence has largely been of a reformist socialist politics, which uses the language of Marxism, but often abandons the revolutionary legacy of Marxism. But regardless of this legitimacy of this reemergence of Marxism, there is clearly an understanding that a return to Marxism has happened in as much as people are talking about Marxism again. But this historical fact does little to tell us why we ought to study Marxism as opposed to later theorists. It just tells us that a project is underway in which people are doing this. And so on the other hand, the more orthodox understanding of a return to Marx also fails to provide a useful justification for studying Marx in particular, I think. The orthodox Marxist return to Marx is a means of throwing out all the successful revolutionary lessons developed in the Russian and Chinese revolution. It treats Marx's writing not as a science which plays out and has played out in revolutionary practice, but as a dogmatically held set of beliefs which all act are actually attempts at revolution have deviated from. So in this sense, I don't think that this idea of a return to Marx as a pre leninist idea is worth studying at all. So, if both of these understandings of a return to Marx fail to be useful for us, why might we return to Marx, us as Red Menace? Why are we going to Marx after having studied Lenin, Stalin, and Mao and Engels already? And I want to suggest one possible justification and contextualize that by looking at the economic and philosophical manuscripts. So one possible reason that we might return to Marx's original work is to understand the ways that Lenin, Stalin, and Mao simultaneously break with Marx while advancing and developing his method. For example, materialism, as is explained in this essay, is absolutely inextricable from humanism. We've really dived into this debate in quite a bit of depth so far. Marx prioritizes the humanist categories of German idealism, and his economic work in this essay can't really be taken apart from that humanism. It provides insights into the human condition and nature in this context. 
And yet, in Lenin, Stalin, and Mao, we see no real humanist core at the center of their applications of materialism. And outside of propaganda, their parties didn't focus much on humanist appeals regarding alienation and natural human relations as they exist outside of capitalism. In fact, the views that Marx holds here are arguably abandoned in his own later works. As we talked about previously, myself and others would argue that the thesis on Feuerbach sees a sort of abandoning of this idea of a stable human essence. So over time, as Marxism has developed, we've seen it move away from some of the central ideas that are present in these manuscripts. Why does this moving away, why did these changes matter, though, is the question we ought to ask. Why should we care that Lenin, Stalin, Mao, and even an older Marx might have broken with some of the ideas that we see in this text? And the answer is that precisely because this break demonstrates the self-critical nature of Marxism, these breaks represent the ability for Marxists to recognize previous theoretical mistakes and correct them moving forward. And as such, we might conclude that one reason to read original Marx texts is to understand the decisions made by later theorists in terms of which ideas to adopt and which to abandon. And in this way, since we as a podcast community have already studied Lenin and Mao, we can return to Marx and understand Lenin and Mao's treatment of his work in more depth. We can better contextualize how these thinkers are not just dogmatically repeating everything Marx said, but are critically engaging with his successes and failures, taking the useful and giving getting rid of those things which actually fell outside of the materialist scope of Marx's own method. In this sense, we at Red Menace and you as our listeners can understand our own return to Marx after having thoroughly studied some of the key works of Lenin, Stalin, and Mao in order to not only historicize these later works, but to understand the methods that these revolutionary leaders employed as theorists making decisions when referencing Marx's text. Marx provides us with both a contrast with later developments, as well as an explanation of the correct ideas that these later theorists would have had to rely on in order to develop Marxism into a practical revolutionary science. And so, in this sense, the economic and the philosophic manuscripts can transcend their status as a somewhat dense and obscure set of manuscripts and serve to deepen our understanding of the overall development of Marxism. So, how would I say that we should apply this text? Well, we should apply this text by looking at how far our theory has come since this time and analyzing the way that revolutionary theorists, through practice, through struggle, were able to abandon what was bad in this text and continue and forward what was good in this text and it can give us a model for doing our own theory going forward as we look back at those theorists and revolutionary leaders who came before us. It provides a lesson for how to do that kind of theoretical development that we can emulate to create theory grounded for our moment that learns from the past and that is based in a scientific self-critical approach. And that's how I think that we can apply this frankly very difficult to understand text. All right, so that concludes our analysis on the application of this text and how it is that the economic manuscripts, you know, affect us today. So we hope that this has been helpful for you. Like I sort of said at the top, this is a weird text because it's really sort of a set of notebooks that got published after Marx already was dead for quite some time. It is a difficult text to work through, and I hope that we're giving you some focus on it, and at least on some of the debates that have emerged around it that might be helpful for thinking through contemporary uh, sort of Marxist politics and and Marxist methodologies. So hopefully this has been helpful. Uh, for next month, we're going to go ahead and move into a much shorter and much easier text than this one, <laughs> which is the Critique of the Gotha Program, where we're going to see some very uh, grounded analysis from Marx, actually, about what building communism looks like, what the transition between lower and higher communism looks like, and we hope that that will be a very fruitful discussion. So that's the text that we'll be looking at next. Uh, like I said before, if you find this at all to be helpful educationally and you want to support our project, please check us out on Patreon at patreon.com slash the Red Menace. And as always, we need to say a huge thank you to our top patrons who really go out of their way to helping us be able to record these episodes. An incredible amount of time goes into the production of these, and it is very appreciated. So huge thank you to Jacob Sparks, as always, to Comrade Garlic Jr., to Anton Panekowik, to Seth Walker, and to the Denny's Committee, uh, <laughs> which is quite strange, but we'll go for it. So thank you to all of you. You can also check us out on uh, Twitter, like I said, at red underscore menace underscore pod, where we'll be posting updates about our various episodes. We hope this has been helpful for you. We're super excited to discuss this next text, and we hope that this sort of move to going back to Marx is bringing out some things that for people who've already read Marx, you maybe didn't get the first time through. Thanks so much for listening. (laughs) 